name is Ian Baker. I'm out of Michigan City, Indiana. And today I've got a display of various British uniforms, equipment, and personal gear from uh, the First World War. Uh, this is all the British uniform. Uh, some of the, the personal gear we've got down here, their, their toiletry roll or hold all. Uh, with things like shaving equipment, teeth, toothbrush, boot polishing, uh, and even a uh, helpful stick to help you polish your buttons. Not that you might do that much in the trenches. Uh, some other personal gear. These would be your identity discs or dog tags that would have your name, your serial number, and what religion you were on them. And uh, these would be worn around your neck. A little, little bit different than the American counterpart of the time. various other gear. You've got uh, compasses, which were rather essential when artillery had blown every landmark off the face of the earth. And then the ever popular eating utensils and uh, the lovely military ration of corned beef. My name is Skyler Zanasek. I'm an Imperial German reenactor uh, dressed in the garb of the German army circa 1914. So what we don't talk about enough about World War I is how it was really the first war that was won by industry as opposed to any army in the field. The German army and Germany in general, while being world renowned for its scientific advances in the early 20th century, did not have industrial capability or the seaports to back up its war effort for a total war like World War I. Britain and France had open seaports. They were able to import any goods they needed pretty much the entire war, and they did. The, however, the British realized early on that to cripple the German war effort, they would need to blockade uh, German sea access, and they did which is where we see German submarines and unrestricted submarine warfare come into play that caused the sinking of the Lusitania, a major contribution to American involvement in World War I. So some great examples of these logistical constraints the German army faced can even be seen in their gear from 1914 to 1918. You see them starting off the war with these nice leather pickle hobs or spiked helmets and by 1916, they had already simplified to a cork helmet, felt lining, just because they needed the leather for other goods, as well as the brass. You can also see it in the basic field gear of the soldier throughout the war, where the Tornister backpack of 1914 was constructed nicely of brass, pony fur, thick canvas. You can see the aluminum mess tin there. But by 1918, they didn't have the resources to continue the production of such nice goods or the capability to manufacture them as quickly. So you see the simplifications in all canvas construction, steel in the mess kit, because Germany did have good steelworks throughout the war, um, which really evident in the lives of the daily soldiers, uh, how those industrial constraints affected the German army and ultimately doomed it from the very early days of the war in 1914. There was no chance after the British blockaded German sea access that Germany could have won the war. A lot of it was either simple masks, or in this case, the one of the early British masks was just a cloth hood with a shield for the eyes, and these would be chemically treated to uh, keep you from getting injured by the gas. But then eventually they went to what was called a small box respirator, which has a fil filter can inside the bag, and then the mask portion would also fit inside the bag, and that would go right on your chest so that when the gas alarm came out, you would just have to pull out the mask and put it on, and uh, it would still be strapped to your body. It was a much more effective system, and uh, the Americans wound up copying that as well. Uh, so by the end of the war, you had the British and the Americans with almost an identical style of gas mask. Uh, so I'm Tom Wachinski from Hammond, Indiana, and I'm here talking about uh, the U.S. U.S. Army uh, when we got our start in, uh, in World War One, 1917. Uh, so uh, we've got 
got a display here of some of the gear that a common soldier would carry. Uh, it's got his raincoat and a jerkin that's borrowed from the English. French gas mask and American gas mask. The first gas mask very prevalent in the First World War. Um, a lot of this borrowed gear is because America, of course, didn't have uh, the production uh, ramped up to meet needs. So we borrowed a lot from the Allies, uh, France and, and England. Got uh, the 1910 pack here with a, your tent and a blanket rolled up at the bottom. You have your raincoat at the top uh, and your rations. The, uh, the good old World War I helmet everybody's used to seeing. Uh, the ammo belt there at the bottom with uh, ammunition for the rifle in each of the pockets. Canteen, a first aid pouch, a big old knife there, it's called a bolo, that was used like a, like a machete basically to uh, clear brush and uh, positions for machine guns actually. Some of the personal items, you got your mess kit, with your uh, heating utensils, a bacon tin for your ration of bacon, hard bread, the emergency ration. A lot of the uh, Americans were fed from a field kitchen, so they didn't really have rations except in necessity. So you'd have what was called the emergency ration and the hard bread and your bacon tin to sort of hold you over if you were away from the field kitchen area. Personal gear, uh, hygiene roll with uh, soap and uh, uh, shaving utensils and uh, things like that, shaving mirror. Extra underwear and socks, very important of course to have extra socks in the trench. Um, and then some of the weapons of course we've got up here. So the American rifle from the war is the 1903 Springfield rifle, which is basically a copy of a German Mauser, um, but uh, made, with, made in America. And then there's the P-17 Eddystone, which is the middle rifle, and that's uh, based on uh, designs from the British, from their Enfield rifle. And then the bottom one is a purely American weapon, that's the M-1897 trench shotgun, which was designed for trench raids. So you jump into the enemy's trench, you'd be in a very close, uh, confined space, and you'd have to just clear the area, so you could just uh, fire with the trench shotgun. Lovely. 1917 weather here. Yeah. Feel like you're you're in the uh, in the period. <laughs>